Hey everybody and welcome to Declutter Me, a podcast about organizing and decluttering your life with your host, Shalina. Hello. Hi, Shrek. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so what do we have for our listeners today? So today we're going to learn a bit about organizing for people affected by ADHD, especially children and young adults. And to do this, I thought it'd be great to talk to a dear friend of mine, Leslie Jossel, who lives in New York and is the founder of Order Out of Chaos. If you remember a few weeks ago, I mentioned a couple of clients with disorders that required me to provide a different kind of help to them. And this is what Leslie is a specialist in. She declutters and organizes, but she deals with ADHD in particular and also focuses on coaching more than actually physically decluttering and organizing, which is what I do. Um, So, yeah, I thought it'd be great to hear about uh, from her. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Um, Thank you so much for being uh, on our show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Leslie started her business 16 years ago, and she calls herself an accidental entrepreneur, which I love. Um, when I started my business, not not many people even knew that, quote unquote, what, what we call organizing was a thing, but mm-hmm. the kind of organizing I was doing specifically, which was working with ADHD families and their children, really wasn't a thing. Most people, when they heard organizer, thought, you know, attic, basement, garages, kitchens, things like that. No one was doing ADHD um, homes or families. Okay. It was absolutely not thought of as a profession. And I always used to say I spent more time explaining to people what I was doing than actually doing it at the beginning. Right. Okay. And then, but what made you get into wanting to do uh, become an organizer? Because I mean, mine was that I was I like this when I was a child. But what what led you to decide to to get into it? When my son, who is now twenty one, so we're going back quite a bit ago, right. was five, he was diagnosed with ADHD, executive dysfunction, um, and a whole host of other things. And you have to remember again, way back then. There was nothing. There weren't many books. There were certainly not podcasts and conferences and even magazines devoted to the subject. So trying to find answers or information to try to help untangle his world, both at home and at school, was, I really came up empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of what I did um, in my home, as well as things that I brought to the school, back then would be considered pretty revolutionary. Um, I don't know if they would be considered it now. Um, So for example, and I think this is important, um, I was very observant of what really set him off or where his frustrations were, where he had quite quite a lot of difficulty. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed right off the bat is whatever he didn't see didn't exist. So for me, everything that um, was a barrier to entry for him. So for example, I took all the closet doors off in his room so that he could easily access what was inside. Dressers was a, were a barrier to entry for him. So out went the dresser and in went clear bins that he could just easily throw his clothing in with a label over it on the wall to make it much easier for him to access his thing. Oh, wow. Um, I did a million other things like that. True story, a friend of mine who's a therapist saw what I did said that she had a patient, a mom with four boys, all under the age of 10, all diagnosed with ADHD, and she felt that um, I could really help her. And you have to understand, I didn't do this for a living. I actually was working part-time at the time, and I did it out of the goodness of my heart. Within two weeks, true story, got four phone calls from that woman's friend saying, I saw what you did at Lisa's house. Would you be able to come to mine? And I turned to my husband and I went, but wait, I, I don't do this for a living. And he said, well, you do now. And I am not kidding you. Um, within, within that month, I quit my job. My, I quit my other job. And within six months, I had a team. Within a month, you like started something completely new. That's amazing. That doesn't happen at all, really. It does not happen. But I think... What I knew what happened was, and I'm going to be very honest, I live in New York. I live about a half hour north of Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Um, there was nobody like me. I think I got in at the right time. Right, okay. A um, couple of things. Number one, there was nobody doing what I was doing. Number two, I was good at it because I understood um, I understood not only what the child was going through, but the dynamic in the family. Right, yeah. 
um, the frustration, the emotion, the confusion, um, you know, not because again, you have to remember there really wasn't information like there is now, mm. you know, we, the internet wasn't even really a thing back then. Now I feel really old. <laughs> um, so I was really able to walk in and say, I understand what you're going through. I've been there. Let me talk to you about what worked in my house, making everything clear and easy to manage was not something people were doing back then. So it quickly grew. But I only, it's funny, when people call me an organizer, I'm like, yes, but I've never done, here's my fun fact, I've yes. never done a basement or a garage. Oh, or a oh. <laughs> but then, but you, you specialize straight into it, uh, you know, immediately. I mean, for, for many of us, it, it takes a while to find the speciality, but yours was immediate, which is... So I always say, you know, I'm, I kind of laugh in, my, in our industry and say I'm not a very good organizer. Right. Um, but I'm very, I think I'm very good at understanding um, where the frustration for a child who can't access what they need or can't find what they need or feel overwhelmed by their surroundings. So interestingly, you know, we know when we talk about chronic disorganization, particularly for, for, for children, you know, calmness works for them. You know, an organized space works for them. So being able to work within a home with both the parent or the caregiver, whomever it is, and the child is instrumental. Mm -hmm. You know, where the frustration also used to lie for me was I would walk in and sometimes I worked with the family, sometimes I just worked with the child, depending on how old the child was. But then I was realizing I was really working in what we call like a vacuum because I would leave and yet the rest of the house was completely disorganized. And I always, you know, if you're in a home working with a family and they have children that you know, have chronic disorganization or have ADHD, you know, have executive dysfunction, they're going to be looking to you to help everyone in the family. Because we know that, you know, once they develop a trust, they want that same person doing everything for their family. Let's talk about what is chronic disorganization and executive dysfunction, because I don't know what executive dysfunction is. I think I know what chronic disorganization is, but... It is very confusing. Um, and that is that also leads to the frustration of parents who might have heard these terms, whether at a doctor's office or in a school, and now they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So we all pretty much know what ADHD is. Um, and in this day and age, ADHD pretty much gets defined, excuse me, by either a hyperactivity or an inability to focus or distractibility mm -hmm. yep. or like an inattentiveness. Yep. But what it doesn't do is paint the whole picture. So again, fun fact is that if you are diagnosed with ADHD, does not matter if you are a child or an adult, you absolutely 100%, there is no gray in this, in this conversation. You automatically have what is called executive dysfunction. And I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. Right, okay. But what isn't the same is if you are being diagnosed with executive dysfunction, you are not necessarily diagnosed with ADHD. It doesn't go back the other way. In fact, more and more researchers and more and more doctors are saying that ADHD is actually an executive functioning disorder. Now, why is that the case? Why is it that when we have ADHD, we automatically have executive dysfunction, but not the other way around? It's because everybody has executive function. Your executive functions start or are located, I should say, in the front of your brain, the frontal lobe. I'm not getting into the science. Right. That's not my my thing. Right, okay. But it's your frontal lobe. And your frontal lobe acts as a conductor. It controls how you see things. It controls how you act. It controls your organization, your time management, your ability to not procrastinate. Mm. It controls your effort, your focus, your mood, your impulsivity. That's what your executive functions do, and you use them thousands and thousands and thousands of times a day. When a child, let's say, is, is diagnosed with executive dysfunction, what happens is certain of those functions are weaker than others. Um, other, like maybe kids that are more neurotypical. So for example, if you have a child at home who has real struggles with time management, they will be at about a 30% less age than their chronological age. So if you have a 13-year-old at home, they might be 13 in all their 13-ness, 
but in time management, they will present at about a nine, at a nine-year-old age. Okay. And how you're going to scaffold and how you're going to support that nine-year-old is very different. Again, when I speak about chronic disorganization, and again, I'm a little different than most, I don't just speak about space and stuff, because that's very easy. That's what we see, right? We see a disorderly bedroom, perhaps. We see a locker, you know, at, in a school where you open up the locker and everything falls out, you know, like a cartoon. Yeah. So that's yeah. very easy for us to notice a child that has has that type of disorganization. Where the word chronic comes in is if that disorganization has major impact, but negative impact on their life. So perhaps you are so disorganized that you can't get out the door in the morning and you are chronically late for work and now you're possibly to be fired. Right. Okay. Or you're so chronically disorganized, you can't get your child out the door in the morning to get to school. And the school has now called and said, your child's been late 20 times this past semester and they are now on probation. Right. Okay. As we move through the chronic disorganization scale, um, at the very end of that scale, to some degree, is hoarding. But I know we don't want to go there. Right, okay, yeah, because that's a whole different... Think about it. If you are chronically disorganized and you are not paying your bills on time, imagine what your credit score is like. Imagine the fees you are accruing. Mm. I mean, you're putting your family perhaps in danger. Or you, I, I've met parents, or not parents, I'm sorry, adults who can't find anything. So what do they do? They just keep buying and buying and buying. And now they're possibly in debt. They have, they've accrued so much credit card debt, they can't get out of it. So these are just different ways that chronic disorganization really impacts you. I like to bring time into that as well. When you do not know where you are in time, if you have no idea your relationship to time, how long something takes you, how long you have left, what you need to be doing now because it might be due a week from now, that's a disorganization. We don't look at it as a disorganization. We just say, oh, I'm, you know, I have no time management, yeah. which is why on the executive functioning scale, organization and time management actually go hand in hand. I, I didn't even actually know this is brilliant because I, I always have clients saying, oh, you know, you're always on time. I can't believe you came just at the right time and you said everything. And now you've put it into perspective that actually it is an issue for a lot of people and a lot of clients and it is something that needs to be thought about more often what i'm hoping your listeners um take away is that you know the inability to time manage or the struggle to time manage is also a disorganization and when i explain it that way i get a lot of people go oh my god that makes so much sense now yeah not that they feel better about themselves but that they understand it a little bit better and see it a little more clearly. Especially when you explain it. I mean, for the adults now, yeah, you know, they will get it from going to work or dealing with the kids and stuff. And, you know, you, you hear about mums feeling overwhelmed because of all the things happening. And if they've got that on top of it, that's not going to help the situation as well, you know, from day yeah, to day. Yeah, exactly. Their day to day is not, or well, listen, there are times, you know, I have met many clients, just as adults now, who say, I was never taught taught how to organize. I don't know how to categorize. So if you're putting away your groceries, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, all my canned goods go here, all my baking goods. If you've never learned, you know, the different ways to categorize, things will be left out on counters. Things will be left on the floor. Things will be left out on any kind of surface. I mean, that's a simplification of it, but it's, but it, it manifests itself that way as well. We don't even look at it as something that's a taught and then, as you said, bring in a parent or maybe it's the mom who is that expectation is they're supposed to be keeping, they're supposed to know how to categorize. They're supposed to know how to file away papers and bills and their kids, you know, art projects. They're supposed to be able to stay on top of the time. And, and they have not been taught how to do so. That is a massive chronic disorganization. And I feel like it's a really big secret and a big frustration. Um, particularly for women. So, but how does that also link then? You, you know, we've talked about ADHD, um, and you know the, the, how that's linked as well with the chronic disorganisation and how you help them to, you know, because when they have ADHD, it's a special type of situation that you have to address, right, with them. So the very to the very first thing I do. Um, 
whenever I'm consulting with a family, it will usually happen to start. It's funny. It can be as simple as my child. You know, the child's bedroom isn't organized. They can't keep it organized. And I always throw it back to the family. And I say, you know, you have to remember the one major principle before you get started into the nitty gritty is does everything in the home have a home? Yes. And you would be surprised, or maybe not, I don't think you would, okay. that the answer is usually no, it doesn't. So there, it has to start there. So if I, now I don't go into people's homes anymore. My company is virtual and global. We do everything virtually, mm. but we do a lot of consulting through, you know, like through Zoom or what have you. And the first question is always, if, does your child, not only does everything have a home, but then does your child know where everything lives? Yeah. Okay. And the answer, again, I get a lot is no. So there's a few rules that I put in place. Or I don't want to say rules because I'm not like that, but more principles. So number one, everything has to have a home, all right? It just does. Right. And if your house, I mean, this is like, a, this is kind of a tough one, but if your home cannot support that, then you need to be taking a hard look at how much you have and perhaps doing some decluttering to make sure that everything you own has its place. That's number one. Because if you are, have a child in the home, that has ADHD or executive dysfunction, that calm, organized home mm. is going to be so much better for their their brain than, than walking through clutter and not being able to find what they need. That's where the frustration and the anxiety and all of that comes into play. Right, okay. The other thing is, particularly for a child, is everything, do they know where everything they use go and is it labeled? I'm very much about labels, particularly for a child with ADHD, because... I like to say more executive functioning because they respond, again, it's easier on the brain. I'm going to go back to those couple of principles I mentioned at the very beginning. Right. Number one, if your child cannot see it, it doesn't exist. And I find that even for adults. Okay. So anything that you can do that's clear, doesn't have to be not pretty, but anything you can do to make whatever it is you're storing for your child or even yourself clear, you will be better off for it. Right. That goes for school supplies, that goes for bins, that goes for, take, again, or taking doors off. I mean, I am. I will literally used to walk into houses, walk right into the kids' room and go, take the closet door off. It's a barrier to entry. So wow. I want you, okay. your listeners, to kind of go around their house and go, where are my barriers to entry? Right. And the barriers to entry don't necessarily have to be only in your child's room. Plenty of adults who have ADHD who have taken closet doors <laughs> off their own closets in the bedroom and just hung a curtain. Right. Because again, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. Okay. And if you're not if it doesn't exist, you're not going to use that space. And therefore you've now eliminated half the space in your home. Does that also apply for say um, kitchen cupboards as well? Is it anything that's a barrier? hundred percent. I have I have absolute moms who have taken off the you know, who've taken off the doors to their cabinet. And just have shelving. Wow. Okay. Cool. Because that goes to the second principle. If it's going to take you more than a few steps to do something, you're not going to do it. Right. Yeah. So if I can make emptying a dishwasher a two-step process, if I can make putting away laundry a two-step process, whether it's for an adult or a child, it's more apt to happen, and therefore the house will stay organized. If a child can take off his jeans or T-shirt and throw it in a bin in his room. I've made it a two-step process. He's more apt to do it. And because, number one, I've made it easy, I've simplified the process, but I've also made it easy for him to stay. Oh, that's good. All right, that's brilliant. And then with the um, like the labeling, I know that I had one client once who said that she believed in colored labeling. Is that really a thing? Because, I mean, I just use the, the, the black and white ones. So I work with students mostly. You know that. And so I'm more about let's look at your space, let's look at your stuff, let's look at your supplies. A lot of S's in there. Our brains actually respond to color and recognize color faster than we do words. Right, okay. So for my students in particular, I will have everything be a specific color for them if they want it. Okay, not a, again, kind of works with the child or the, or the adult. So I am not a color-coded girl. I, I like everything neutral because it calms my brain. Mm. But again, I don't have ADHD. But my son, for example, who's 21, all through school, anything that was like math-related, so the binder, the notebook, the folder, even the bin, the math stuff went in, was green. Right, okay. Green was money, and I don't know why he equated math with green. Oh, that makes sense. Because yeah. what happened is even in a messy locker, he could open a locker, and as soon as he saw anything green, 
he knew exactly that that was from Anne. Wow, that is brilliant. That I just, that is a genius idea. It really is. It's an incredible. Our brains are really interesting, and I always say you have to understand how your brain thinks and processes information to be able to understand how you how you're going to organize. So, yeah. and I see, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this to my son. I see it with my son, who within the last four years graduated high school, was in college, did an internship in Los Angeles, went and lived in a house, now back in a you know, a different room in the dorm. And he's like, it doesn't matter. I just take my systems with me. They're portable because everything is by color. So you can use those systems. It doesn't, you know, you can just use the different colors for different subjects. It doesn't matter. You know, you, you know, like you said, maths was green, but you could always go and do green for, say, law, if you're studying law later or something. Well, and it doesn't have to be for subjects. I, I have moms who have, who have done it because they're just, you know, they struggle with chronic disorganization. So yep. they might... If they have say, if they have multiple children and one is taking dance and another is playing soccer and another one is the, believe it or not the tote bags are color coded wow. by, by by what activity it is right okay you can take it endlessly you can do it with post it notes I have one parent that I worked with just four children who did it I'm, I thought this is hysterical she did it for packing cubes so when they would go away. Didn't you know, right? Like a packing cube, you know, when you go away, you go, yep. I love packing cubes. You know, <laughs> let's say Leslie was red. So Leslie on the calendar would be red. Leslie's packing cubes were red. Leslie's tote bags for dance were red. I, that is brilliant yeah, if you think about that's it. Brilliant, Again, yeah. it, it, it takes the pressure off the brain, and that's what we want to do. If you struggle with chronic disorganization, if you struggle with ADHD, if you struggle with executive functioning, it's almost as if your brain can only lift like a two pound weight mm. but what it's being required to do is lift a five pound weight right okay. and what we need to do is exercise the brain so it gets it to that five pound weight and putting in these types of systems where things are clear or we've removed barriers to entry or we've simplified you know systems or we've color coded or we've labeled is exercising the brain to get it to that five pound weight I, I hope that because I want you guys to think of a cute little brain with little dumbbells, you know, <laughs> trying to lift. But that's exactly how I describe it. And when I do that, particularly adults go, oh, my goodness, I see it now. You've got to exercise the brain, too, whether you're a 50-year-old woman or whether you're a 13-year-old boy, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's, that's a brilliant analogy. And I'm, now I'm imagining the, 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 the dumbbells on the side as well. That's brilliant. <laughs> That was just weird. <laughs> so that's, oh. that's my that's kind of my picture for, for yeah. Everybody. Thank you for that. <laughs> you know, just any anything that's going to work for you. Make it make it as visible and visual as you can. Cues and clues, you know, just um, but simplify. But you know, I'm 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 not one. This is something that's big here in the states. Is an appliance that only has one purpose. Like a bagel cutter, you know, like just buy a knife. You don't need something just oh, to cut a bagel. You need you need a knife, a, you know, multi-purpose. It's just too much stuff then. And then, yeah, that would affect people's brains, like having to decide what to, they're supposed to use for their day-to-day -day lives, right? So this this has been fascinating, I have to say. And I know I have I've heard you present before and discuss this, but... Just seeing it from a different angle and discussing it today has just been so interesting. So thank you so much, Leslie, for this. I'm going to include, of course, your your details of how to contact you, you know, if because you do do this virtually and you, you've helped people and you've been here as well to the Middle East as well, haven't you? I was very privileged to be invited to Kuwait, which was really a, an incredible experience last March. Um, there's, there's an American university in Kuwait that has a Kuwait Association for ADHD and Learning Disabilities. Um, they put on this very big conference, um, and I went and I gave five presentations to mostly teachers, parents, and related professionals. I always say education is a universal language. It doesn't matter where you live in the world, but trying to help students be successful in learning and in life, for me, is a universal language. Well, now you'll have to come and do the same thing in Dubai so we can meet up. <laughs> I'm going to in a minute. It was seriously, um, I can't, I, I, people ask me all the time, how did I feel? And I said it was just the most incredible experience because, yes, you're not obviously not the same language, but you are speaking the same language. 
So again, Leslie's company is called Order Out of Chaos and her website address is orderoochaos.com where you can find a huge number of resources and also get in touch with Leslie herself. She does help people globally as well as um, nationally in the US. So you can always get in touch with her to help you. There's also a link in the show notes. So it's always nice to do one of these different kind of conversations and get some experts in to talk about what they do. Um, as always, you can find all of the episodes of this show for free in your favorite podcast player. So look us up. Um, and you can also get in touch with Shalina either on her website, which is declutterme.com. So that's D-E-C-L-U-T-T-R-M-E. Or on social media, just look for Declutter Me. Thank you for listening in and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.